Welcome, everybody. It's great to see you back again. Today is uh, April 28th, and it's the final one of our fireside chats that uh, we'll be hosting this semester. Uh, we'll be in touch with uh, uh, Dr. Zabulizem and Landrigan and see if they'd like to continue this in the fall. And if there's a need, we'll, we'll figure that out later. But um, as all of us turn toward uh, uh, wrapping up our classes and thinking about summer work, uh, we'll be on hiatus at the least um, for these fireside chats. But I'd like to start by um, just thanking all of those who have participated in this. Of course, our speakers, uh, uh, both Nadia and Phil, but also our other speakers who have joined us, uh, but also all of you who have been uh, attending these and have been writing in questions or speaking at these sessions. We really appreciate the community you're helping to build, and we hope that this has been a, uh, a useful uh, process. There have been uh, many hundreds of views online as well, and I wanna thank BC's uh, social media and communications office especially Zana Alev, uh, for helping to put these online and make that possible. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, as you all know, you've been reading the news. Uh, there have been a lot of reports recently about some uh, drugs in development uh, that have been, uh, the tests have been looking bad and uh, recent news about uh, vaccine work based out of Oxford that looks more positive. We've seen developments in politics and uh, policy and, and uh, health outcomes um, around the country and around the world as, as countries like Denmark open up a bit and states like Texas or Tennessee and Georgia start to open up a bit. Uh, we have politicians and policymakers and intellectuals writing about the phased process. You know, of course, the debate continues about whether or not the projections are optimistic or pessimistic or doable or what. So um, it is a special uh, privilege to be in conversation with two experts here about these issues. And I hope that we'll um, look at uh, the current state of affairs and, and look ahead to the summer and, and perhaps the fall as well. Um, so as usual, we'll, we, uh, we'd like to start with Nadia giving us a, um, a look around the country and the world about the epidemiological numbers and other uh, aspects that you'd like to report on. And then we'll, then we'll move to Phil for the next stages. So thank you, Nadia, for being here. No problem. Did you want to give the fireside chat introduction again or no? <laughs> um, I think everybody's been here before, but uh, <laughs> I just, um, I have repeatedly, you know, tried to say, especially for younger people on the panel here, that, uh, that our, the fireside chat model has been based on um, uh, inspiring work that President Franklin Roosevelt did in the 1930s and 40s to communicate directly with people um, uh, about the Great Depression and the war that was coming and then did come. Uh, in the early 40s. And um, well, our president uh, frequently uses Twitter to move directly in contact with the people, uh, we knew that a more uh, humane and personal conversation through Zoom would, would might serve that purposes as well. So I do think that's been accomplished. And thank you, Nadia, for the reminder. Um, I, um, I will, we'll, we'll see how this goes in the future. But, uh, but for now, I'm just uh, uh, mostly extremely grateful to, to all of you and, and especially to Nadia and Phil. Yeah, thank you. And it's really uh, been through your organizing efforts that this has been possible. So we're very grateful that you've been willing to organize and get this together. It's been a really uh, wonderful joy uh, for me to participate. Um, so I'm going to try to give a little bit of the epidemiologic perspective again. I have a number of different things that have popped up on my radar that I'd like to share. Uh, I will say up front, this has been a very overwhelming information week for me, so I'm not sure that my comments will be exhaustive, um, but certainly trying to give you a glimpse at uh, what has been happening around the world. So we'll start off as usual with our view of the Johns Hopkins map, um, just to say that we are now over 3 million confirmed cases globally with over 200,000 deaths globally. Um, and you can see that the United States um, does at this point top the rankings for confirmed cases. Um, the US map um, has been updated um, and it just takes a second to load here. But um, from this map, you can see that there are large concentrations, hopefully it loads, of the epidemic um, in various parts of the country, primarily concentrated around New York City. Um, we also see high concentrations in Louisiana. Um, the total number of uh, confirmed cases in the United States, as was um, on the previous slide, is quite high. And if you look at the bottom, um, the bottom right corner here with this yellow line of confirmed cases, it does seem like we might be coming to the top of that curve, um, although the deaths um, have been fluctuating as well as we 
um, look at the death data. Um, so you're welcome to take a look at this map from what I understand actually um, this map is viewed uh, somewhere on the order of a million times a day. So there's, this is clearly a good resource for people. Okay, so something I wanted to mention was something that happened last week after our conversation, and that was um, the president's comments about the use of disinfectants um, to try to treat coronavirus. And I just want to say that while um, and I have also made jokes about this. I've been quite flippant about um, how silly it might seem. There is data from the CDC that is suggesting that they have seen an uptick in the number of daily exposures to cleaners and disinfectants in the past few weeks. Um, I would argue that this is likely a direct result of the messaging received from the administration about the safety. Um, and the really um, cool thing about this data is it kind of proves unequivocally that this is not a seasonal result. Um, they compare the results, uh, the number of calls um, to 2018 and 2019. So you can see that the 2020 data in black here is clearly higher for the past few weeks uh, than for previous years. So I, this is all to say, and we've talked about this before, and I'll say it again, uh, politics influences public health public perception and public understanding is really quite important. And unfortunately, <laughs> excuse me, the communication from the top could be really detrimental and really uh, dangerous to people's health. Um, I will also just mention that there has been a lot of discussion about death rates um, in the past few weeks. And there's been a really interesting analysis done by colleagues at Yale University trying to understand the burden of deaths over the past few weeks um, in various places. And I just want to note here that the really important thing about this analysis is that they're not only accounting for deaths due to coronavirus, which we obviously know have increased over the past few weeks, but they're also accounting for excess deaths, deaths that are not necessarily due to coronavirus, but could be attributed to the epidemic in some way. So these would be cases of people not going to the hospital despite having pre-existing conditions and dying. They might not have died directly from coronavirus infection, but as a result of um, this, the ongoing healthcare issues that we're facing due to coronavirus. And so at the beginning of this article, they do a really nice job of displaying the total number of excess deaths reported, um, again, over the what is historically expected for this time period um, in the US overall. So this essentially says that, yes, we are seeing excess deaths due to coronavirus, but we're also seeing excess deaths due to other reasons, which is likely due to failures in our healthcare system or our inability to um, help people who have pre-existing conditions in many cases. This can also, I will say, be attributed to injuries such as drug overdoses or suicide attempts, which we have seen on the rise um, lately as well. And the really neat thing about this paper is it goes through and gives you uh, screenshots and examples of various places where you can see whether um, excess deaths have been an issue. And in New York City in particular, and New York State, uh, New Jersey, excess deaths are a large issue. Um, and we can hypothesize some of the reasons why that might be. Uh, the hospitals are overwhelmed, people are not going to hospitals for reasons other than coronavirus. And so you tend to see um, a number of uh, deaths due to this. And you can see that the number of excess deaths increases in nearly every place after a lockdown occurs. So again, this is people's inability to access healthcare. Um, so if you're interested, this is a really great Washington Post article, um, and you can actually access it through the paywall through BC Library. So I'll just say that um, if you're interested in, be, in accessing that. Um, Eric just pointed me to some really interesting uh, data on um, the outbreak that has been published in the New York Times. Uh, looking at places where we might expect um, the outbreak to be worse um, or getting worse in many cases. Um, and our conversation before starting to record was that the places where um, the new cases have been increasing in the past a few weeks um, have actually been places in the Midwest where perhaps the lockdowns happened a little bit later. Um, perhaps the um, restrictions have not been as uh, extreme as on the coast, of course, um, in places where the, the epidemic has been ongoing, we see that um, in, like in New York City or in New Jersey, we're seeing flat or decreasing growth rates, which is what we would expect if we're on the other side of that epidemic peak. 
Um, and then the other cool um, data that they are sort of predicting is where outbreaks might come next. And again, the, the places here, as I just mentioned, are mostly places in um, the middle of the country, uh, some places in su the southern part of the country as well. So this is all going to be relevant to our responses, especially in the context of the conversations around reopening that are happening now. Uh, we need to be really cautious about reopening when there is still the potential for spread. Um, the second to last thing I want to talk about is the fatality rate. This is something that was discussed very early on in the epidemic. Again, this is the number of deaths out of the total uh, people infected. This sort of gives you a sense of how dangerous, quote unquote, the, the, the uh, virus is. And this is, I will say, a blog post written by a science um, a scientist, a scientist that I know through Twitter. Um, he's compiled data from modeling studies, observational studies, and also data from preprints. So again, these are papers that have been submitted for review but have not gone through peer review. And essentially, um, the conclusions from all of the papers he could find on the fatality rate uh, suggest that the overall fatality rate is about 0.75%. Um, and so this gives us a sense that perhaps um, in the beginning of the epidemic, we were seeing numbers much higher than this, but perhaps this has stabilized. Um, this is also a working uh, document, meaning that he will update it with updating uh, more updated information. So um, I'm happy to put it in the chat if people want to um, keep tabs on this information. It is important. I think people have moved on, hopefully, from this conversation of, is this like the flu? Is this more dangerous than the flu? I don't think those conversations are helpful for a number of reasons. One, the flu is dangerous still, and so we don't want to take away from how dangerous the flu is. Um, and two, we need to treat coronavirus independent of the flu as well. The last thing I just wanted to mention, um, and this is much more about what I've been thinking about with regards to science lately, is this idea that there are so many groups now working on coronavirus research, um, and there are so many new projects and clinical trials that have started to try to assess whether that's coronavirus treatment or coronavirus vaccine. And one really neat thing that I've seen come out of this is a sense of collaboration and a desire to work together and not replicate efforts. So this coronavirus collaboration platform has been created um, and it actually helps people who are doing this science share protocols, um, see if they can not replicate efforts um, it's a really neat collaborative uh, science experiment, and I really think that we should try to keep our eye on this. I do think um, this is sort of one indication, one hopeful note for me from the coronavirus outbreak is that we're finding new ways, new effective ways, but also new collaborative ways to do science. Um, and I think the evolution of science throughout this epidemic will be quite interesting um, as, we, as we move forward. So those were some of my thoughts uh, just to start the conversation and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, as we go along. So thanks for allowing me to share them. Thanks so much, Nadia. Um, yeah, feel free to drop those links into the uh, chat box. A reminder to BC folks here that um, the, all these resources, the Times and the Post and even I think the Wall Street Journal are available through the BC library, but you need to be through a VPN to uh, make the computer think that you're based or you're you know, securely uh, part of the BC system before you do that. And uh, I'll post one article from this morning that was interesting around, uh, speaking to Nadia's last point around collaboration, there was a um, original reporting from the Wall Street Journal this morning about a, a, a biotech investor based in Boston who's uh, put together a group of high-end uh, researchers who have been uh, trying to think about policy and health um, obstacles that need to be overcome and they've got sort of a direct channel to the White House about uh, reflecting on that. So that's the Wall Street Journal article that I just posted. Um, Phil, thank you very much for being here again, as always. Um, uh, what have you seen in the past week that we can, uh, that we can talk about today? Well, th thank you, Eric. Several things. And first of all, I, I want to begin by doing what Nadia did, and that is thank you for your leadership and having put this thing together. It's really been a great a great series of talks. Um, I've enjoyed it. Uh, the fact that we have so many of the same faces coming back every week, clearly, at least a couple of you have gotten something out of it. So, um, so that's all good. <coughs> the, I, several points I'd like to make. First, I'd like to pick up on something that Nadia 
said and, and put it in the historical perspective. Nadia mentioned the fact that in city after city as the pandemic has swept through, there's been this big increase in total number of deaths, not just in COVID-19 deaths, but also in total number of deaths. And this has been seen before. And a, a classic example was in the 19, early, I think it was 50, 1952, one of the worst air pollution disasters in history, at least up until that time, was the so-called London fog. It wasn't a fog at all, it was a pollution episode. Um, and for a long time, the standard teaching was that 4,000 people had died in the, in the London fog. But then about 10 years ago, when epidemiologists went back and really looked in a more holistic fashion at death rates in London during the, the relatively short period of time when the fog was there, which was only four or five days, they found that in fact there were 12,000 excess deaths, not 4,000, but 12,000. And it was probably a mix of several things. There were, there were, as Nadia said, there were some people that had other conditions and simply couldn't get to hospital. There were people that had underlying disease that was made worse by the, the, the bad air pollution. And then there were people who directly died of the air pollution, but it wasn't properly recorded. And at the end of the day, those statistics all depend upon what's written down by the attending physician on the death certificate. And, and those death certificate diagnoses are not always perfect. So this, this is a recurrent phenomenon, and we're going to see this elsewhere in the country. Second point with regard to air pollution, information is now coming out from several places that chronic exposure to air pollution increases the mortality rate from COVID-19. There was a super paper that came out about a week ago from the Harvard School of Public Health that looked county by county in the United States saw very clearly that counties with higher levels of air pollution have higher mortality rates, and they were even able to compute a do an exposure response relationship, which is striking in its clarity. They found that each one microgram increase in air pollution level accounted for 15% increase in COVID-19 mortality. That's, that's pretty stark. And there was another paper that came out the other day from Europe showing that the um, uh, high rates of mortality seen in Northern Italy and also in Central Spain during the COVID-19 occurred in places where background rates of air pollution were higher. The, the American studies looked at particulate air pollution, what's known as PM 2.5. The European studies looked at oxides of nitrogen, known as NOx, but they, they both found comparable results. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, uh, what are the prospects for reopening? I've been, I've been giving a lot of thought to the question. I'll, I'll say up front, I don't have a definitive yes, no answer. I don't think anybody does at this point. It's a burning question for anyone except the graduating seniors as to whether BC will reopen in the fall, but I haven't been giving a lot of thought to what are the factors that university leadership will need to consider as they as they plan for the reopening. I want to take a couple of minutes just to go through those with you. Um, the, the very first thing is what we, what Nadia, have been talking about every week in this session. What's the epidemic doing? What's, what's the curve look like? Is it still going up? Is it flat? Is it going down? Unless it's going down, it's clear to me that no university can, can safely reopen. It just it won't be possible. But that said, I think there's a pretty good likelihood that the current wave of cases is going to have gone well down by mid-August when we have to think seriously about reopening. I say that for several reasons. First of all, we've seen the shape of the curve in the various European countries that were hit before us. It's going down. Nadia just shared the data for American cities and the cities like New York that we hit first are flat to slightly down. I get the daily feed from my old institution, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and the Mount Sinai Health System has gone down from a peak of about 2,200 admissions per day about 10 days ago, down to about half that now. And it's been a gradual, slow 
decline. So it's probably real. It's not a weekend phenomenon or something like that. It's a real decline. Um, and Boston's running about a week behind New York, and maybe we're going to start seeing the decline about now. And it's still only only April. So I, I think this this wave will have will have faded by summer. The, that the, in no way, however, does that exclude the possibility that there could be a second wave or a third wave or a fourth wave. And there is absolutely the potential for a second or a third or a fourth wave because one inevitable consequence of physical distancing and flattening the curve is that there are still lots and lots of us out there who haven't been infected, or at least not that we know of. And we are, we are tender waiting for the fire. So if reopening isn't done wisely, there could be a second wave. I doubt that it would be as big or as bad as the first wave, but it could be big enough and it could be bad enough. And we have to be, we have to be open to the possibility. <clears throat> so with, with that said, what are some of the other things that an institution such as Boston College is going to have to think about if, if they want to move forward, even if they want to put together, even if the university wants to put together a contingency plan, what are the, what are the elements that they're going to have to have in place? Well, the first thing they're going to need to have is uh, they're going to have to have a handle on the ability to do testing. And, and that, what, what I mean specifically is that if the university reopens, we need to have 24 seven 365 accessibility to testing capacity. And there are two kinds of tests here. Number one, there's the nasal swab where they put a cotton swab up into your nasal passages, take some mucus and test it to see if you have live virus in there. And if, if you have live virus, then that means you have an infection and that you're potentially contagious if you come in contact with other people. And then the second type of test is a serological test where they measure serum antibodies. And somebody who has antibodies uh, is a person who has already had the infection and most probably is protected. It's not 100% certain that antibodies to COVID-19 confer, confer protection, but probably. So those are the two kinds of tests. And we need to have both because they, they give different bits of information. Number one tells us who's actively infected and potentially contagious. And number two tells us who's protected and has an invisible suit of armor and can go anywhere. So that's the first thing we need. The second thing we'll need when and if we come back is what is known in the trade as syndromic surveillance. And that, that's an organized system um, where on a daily basis um, in every dorm, in every place where people congregate, there are people assigned, people who've been given some training, who are assigned to monitor for the folks who have symptoms that might indicate that they're coming down with COVID-19. Uh, cough, cold, fever, chest pain, shaking, chills, diarrhea, any of those things that could be, that could be symptoms of, of COVID. And we all recognize anybody who's been around understands that these symptoms are nonspecific. None of them says absolutely that a person has COVID. That's why it's called syndromic surveillance. You're, you're monitoring for, this, for the syndrome. But what happens is you have a monitor, let's say in each dorm, in each corridor or something in the dorm. And that person has the responsibility once a day or twice a day to knock on each door in the dormitory, in their, in their sector of the dormitory and <clears throat> ask about infections. <clears throat> and if a person is having symptoms immediately, <clears throat> sorry about that, it's not, it's not COVID, I haven't had any contact. Um, if a person has symptoms, get them immediately for nasal swab testing and those results will become available in a matter of hours. If it's something else, then just deal with it. But if it's COVID-19, then you have to be able to put them immediately into isolation. And so that's the next element of planning that BC needs to have in place. They need to have testing. <clears throat> they need to have syndromic surveillance. <clears throat> and they need to have capacity uh, to put people who've got symptoms. Um, maybe one of the dorms is designated the isolation dorm. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, not sure what 
how logistically they'll do it, but they'll have to have a plan for, for coping with this. And the isolation period, as I'm sure you've all heard, is, is 14 days. If you have active infection, you can't be exposed to unexposed people for the next 14 days. We also have to have something called contract, contact tracing, which really goes hand in hand with syndromic surveillance. That is to say, the interviewer, the dormitory monitor, whatever you want to call that person, who goes door to door and asks about symptoms, if a person has symptoms and tests positive and gets isolated, they need to be interviewed and, and they need to be asked, okay, who have you come in contact with in the last in the last couple of weeks who could have given it to you and to whom you might have given it? It's a tedious job, but this is what's been going on very effectively in some of the European countries and in New Zealand, other places that have really flattened the curve have had a whole cadre of people who've been trained to do contact tracing. And some of you may have heard that this model has now been adopted in Massachusetts, that Governor Baker um, has partnered with Paul Farmer's group, Dr. Paul Farmer at Harvard Medical School's group partner in health. Uh, PIH have been doing contract tracing for TB contacts for years. They're very good at it. And they've got about a thousand young people. I think there's some BC students among them who have volunteered for this work in Massachusetts and who are doing it even as we speak. So we know how to do it. It's just a matter of logistics. Then um, there's a couple of other things to uh, consider if, if we do come back. Um, and this has to do with differences in vulnerability. So the good news story here is that people in the age group of most college students are tend to have good outcomes from COVID-19. Nothing's 100%. We've all heard stories about young people that have had bad outcomes, cytokine storms, hypercoagulopathies and things like that. But statistically speaking, young people that get COVID-19 do well. Older people, not so well. And they're really old, not, not very well at all. Also people with underlying disease, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, other chronic conditions, immune deficiencies don't do so well. And of course, we have such people on the campus. Uh, we have some students with underlying disease. We have faculty members with underlying disease. And we certainly have faculty members who are older. So if we do come back, whether it's in August or October or January, what do we do about the vulnerable people in the community? And until we have a vaccine, until we have a treatment, uh, we're going to have to uh, take special precautions for those folks. Um, and then there's a few other details that have to be available. We have to have adequate amounts of personal protective equipment. We need to, uh, we need to uh, maintain physical distancing. Of course, all of this could change. All of this could change radically if either of two optimistic scenarios comes along, if either a vaccine comes along or a treatment. Um, I'm, very heartened by what Eric reported, what we've all seen in the paper about people in Oxford working on a vaccine. But bear in mind that no vaccine can go into, wild into wide use until it's been field tested, usually on, initially on five or 10 people, then 100 people. Those people have to be followed for a couple of weeks in each cycle. And then even after you've got a vaccine that appears to be safe and effective, it takes a certain amount of time for the manufacturers to bring it up to scale. I have no doubt that in the current crisis, all of those stages will be foreshortened. But still, there's some inherent delays built in there. And I, I can't imagine that there's going to be a vaccine available by the time classes would normally start in late August, maybe midway through the next academic year in the best of all possible worlds. But I, I can't imagine any sooner. I'm a little more optimistic on treatment. The drug remdesivir seems to be effective in some very small clinical trials to date. It's been effective in the treatment of individual cases in Washington State, Seattle area. So maybe, but the clinical trials again will take a certain number of weeks to go through. On the other hand, if they, if the, if the clinical trials do show efficacy, it's a lot quicker to ramp up manufacturing for a drug and, and get it out there. There'll still be questions of who profits whether it's widely available, political questions, really. But, um, but the technology is there. 
So I think I think that that's where we are now. The the reopening question will be something that the university and every university is going to have to struggle with over the coming months. I'll, I'll close by mentioning um, a very interesting letter that's been circulating on the internet for the past week or so from a man named Mitch Daniels, who's the president of Purdue. He's an interesting guy. He, um, he probably started off as a political scientist, Eric. I'm not sure. He was uh, the head of the Office of Management and Budget in uh, President Bush's administration. Then he was governor of Indiana before Mike Pence, and he's now the president of Purdue, the big engineering school in Lafayette, Indiana. And he has decided that they're going to open the Purdue campus uh, on schedule in late August or early September, whatever's their start date. And his logic is based on the fact that students have a low rate of serious disease. Education is important. And they'll just take measures to protect the vulnerable and the senior faculty. But they're going to go ahead with it. They'll do face to face where they can get away with it. They'll do distance education where necessary, um, but they're going to bring the students back. So that's that's one model, and um, we'll see how it evolves. Thank you, Eric. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, it's so helpful. And as we start to get questions from people in the chat box, or if you raise your hands, um, let me just um, continue on the Boston College front for a second, uh, because I know that's. Um, been on a lot of people's minds lately as we turn to the end of the semester and look forward. Um, I wonder if either or both of you could say something about social distancing in the classroom. Those of us who, I mean, for all of us, I guess, are impacted by the classroom where that's the business of a university and those of us who teach in the classroom, but also students uh, as well. Um, um, there's been conversations in the, the um, Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle of Higher Ed and other uh, education-oriented places around the sorts of um, uh, brainstorming about what social distancing might look like in a classroom. Let's say you have a lecture hall like, you know, Gasson, or, uh, Higgins 300 with 175 wow. seats in it and you draw, a, a, you know, a one meter circle around each seat. Um, you're gonna cut that into, I don't know, let's cut it by 70% or something. I'm not, I can't, <laughs> I don't do the, the math, but, uh, but the chart looks very different. And so one of the speculations has been, you know, maybe a, a third of the students rotate physically into the class each session and the other two thirds take it online or things like that. Have you, both of you, uh, put any thought into what teaching might look like? I know this is shifting out of public health and into pedagogy or things like that, but, but I think that it speaks to the character of an education we might be able to provide, uh, even if we were to provide a safe environment for students and faculty uh, in all the ways that you just mentioned. Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to take the first shot at that. So I, I think I, I think the, the, the approach here is to segment the educational enterprise into, into various pieces. Um, and some are much more easily managed than others. So I think, for example, that some of the postgraduate work of the university and some of the laboratory-based education, for example, in, in, in Higgins Hall, might be able to start up sooner because you're dealing with small groups of people who are in an environment where they can, in, in a whole work setting, where they can maintain physical distancing. And, and instead of massive classroom teaching, the educational process is more either small group interaction or one-on-one -on -one conversations with a mentor. I think all of that is more easily managed in a world where there's no vaccine and, and no treatment and we have to continue to rely on physical distancing. I think the existence of and the availability of antibody testing is going to make a huge difference because if certain people of any age group are determined to have antibodies and therefore to be presumed protected against the disease, uh, we can treat them differently than people who are still vulnerable. Okay, so that's the so the first thing is antibodies. The second thing is small group teaching. I think I think classes for juniors and seniors, you know, the, the smaller group, more seminar type classes with smaller numbers of students, it might be possible to do those and maintain social distancing. The big classes like 
Higgins 300 with 175 people. I don't know how in the world you do that. I, I think the only, there's only two possibilities. One is, is what you just said, Eric, staggered shifts where Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Monday is one student, one group of students, Wednesday a second, Friday a third group. Or the other is you just say, we're, for those big classes, we'll just uh, continue to do distance learning, even if the distance learning is from the professor's living room to the dorm room, we still do it over the computer. Uh, even though students might be back on campus. And perhaps then the discussion groups could meet in person uh, as opposed to the lectures that could be flipped in that way. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Nadia, do you want to jump I, in or I, I, I get really overwhelmed thinking about some of the logistics associated with the fall, um, especially sort of the reopening and having in-person classes. I think um, the logistics discussions can get really technical. Um, I think it's, you know, at this point, um, it's really overwhelming to think about. I, I just want to say two points about things that I've been thinking about. One is, um, how do we ensure the sense of community in the classroom that a lot of us really foster and really appreciate? Um, and I think that that's a really big concern for me, especially if we think about some sort of I don't know if there would be some sort of dual or hybrid teaching. Um, how are we maintaining that sense of community? And the second point that I think we really need to keep in the back of my, our minds is how are we going to continue ensuring that there aren't inequities in learning um, and inequities in opportunity. Um, and I think that that really hopefully will be on the forefront of teachers' minds when they're designing um, their teaching strategies, when we're talking about how it is we might have these classes in the fall. I hope that we're thinking about these potential inequities not only in learning style, um, background, you know, privilege, whatever it might be, but um, also challenging the norms. I think this could be a really interesting opportunity to restructure and rethink about what pedagogy means in the classroom. Um, so in some ways I find it really overwhelming and in other ways I find it almost exciting to try to challenge the status quo about what pedagogy looks like. Yeah, thank you. I think so as well. I think, th and these, the directions of that uh, questions around justice and equity point in sometimes surprising directions. Uh, it might be that in order to think more clearly about justice, um, we may need uh, more people on campus uh, to equalize the access uh, online and the synchronicity of things. Uh, on the other hand, there are some times at which, you know, not exposing people uh, with vulnerabilities means uh, making sure that they have full access off campus. And it's a really, I, my head hurts thinking about all of these logistics too. And, and um, you know, your heart swoons as well with worry and, um, and also concern to restore the community that makes our program so special, the things that makes Boston College what it is and what makes uh, faculty so committed to our students and vice versa is the, the way that we want to, to teach and that this is really challenging that. So it does provide opportunities for us to, to think about it carefully. Um, Phil, go ahead. It is, in my mind, there's also a risk-benefit dimension to this conversation, and that, and that has to do with the fact that the risk to people of college age is low, and the benefit of education, both to the individual students, as well as to the community, as well as to the wider society, is very high. And I, I think we have to get past the notion that we can operate in a zero risk environment. Because I, I think there's going to, until there's a vaccine or a treatment, there's going to be residual risk here. Um, nobody can tell you otherwise. Um, and so it's not a question of zero risk, it's a question of how much risk can we live with? Because uh, I, I, I don't think we can just shut down and go away. I mean, that, that serves nobody at all, at least of all the students. But I think, and on that note, I, I do think that it's really important to think about who is experiencing those risks most tangibly. And there's certainly going to be inequities in who is experiencing those risks. And so, yes, it is a, you know, it, it will not be a zero risk situation, but how are we going to ensure that our most vulnerable students, our students coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, aren't going to be facing or dealing with the burdens of that risk, um, whether that's on campus or online. So. You know, I, I agree that it's, it's, it's an impossible decision uh, in some ways. Um, and I also think it's important to say that I don't think these decisions can really be made at this point. I think we really do need to wait until 
um, at least the early summer to figure out what's happening with the epidemic and how the dynamics will change over time. Thank with, you that last point, with that last point, I agree absolutely. This is going to be, the response is going to be shaped by externalities, the shape of the epidemic, whether a silver bullet comes along. We have a few questions. And again, I encourage folks to raise their digital hand if you'd like to add your questions to these. Um, um, the Atessa's question here uh, seems to carry along the same thread of, of um, while we're um, moving outward toward the summer and these decisions start to be made, she is expressing, um, uh, you know, thanks for these conversations that we've been having and looking for another resource for um, what she says is uh, calm fact, fact and science-based resources uh, over the summer. Can either of you recommend good sites for uh, community and, and clear thinking about this that isn't uh, either so overwhelming that you have to spend two days searching through it or um, so uh, aggravatingly politicized that, uh, that they won't really be useful? New York Times. I, I mean, I think what I've been doing personally, and again, this may not work for everyone, I've sort of curated my own Twitter feed with people that I trust, information that I trust, and um, I try to follow people who are not sensationalizing things, who are very fact-based and science-based. And so I've been uh, lucky enough to be able to curate my own sort of uh, Twitter feed. Um, I'm also uh, toying with the idea of trying to set up something more public-facing to continue disseminating information. So if that happens, I'm happy to try to pass along that information. But um, I think for each person, depending on your interests and what you're interested in keeping track of, uh, trying to curate a list for yourself of people you trust and sources you trust might be the best way to go about doing it. Well, one thing we, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing we might do, uh, if you're willing, Nadia, for example, is to uh, make public your group. Uh, you can do that on Twitter. You, if you have lists of uh, people that you'd that you're following, we could uh, we could provide a link to that, um, and uh, maybe brainstorm the three of us uh, and others about uh, a resource page that we could put up uh, for for anyone who's interested, and we could keep that updated, and of course include your personal sites uh, uh, as well to point people to. So, uh, thanks for that question. Um, Sarah Buckley asked, I think, what's on a lot of our minds here uh, about reopening of states and. Um, uh, anxieties, <laughs> looking forward about what will happen. Um, she asks, you know, what's your opinion on the feasibility of the opening of states? Um, either of you want to start with that question? Well, I think some are reopening too early. I, 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 we, we've said, Nadia and I have both said that the, the rational reopening needs to be based on very careful assessment of the, epi of, of the epidemic curve. It probably needs to be gradual with low risk activities opening first and big events like rock concerts and football games probably not happening this year. Uh, I think just opening a whole state willy nilly at this stage of the game is um, uh, inviting tragedy. I really do. Yeah, I agree. I think it's probably a little bit too soon to be talking about reopening states. Um, at the same time, I think I'm hearing a lot of um, frustration, impatience uh, that people are dealing with in their own lives, unable to work, unable to make money, clearly is a huge economic issue. Um, and so, you know, while opening up an entire state, as Phil said, I think also would be irresponsible perhaps thinking um, creatively about ways to make a slow targeted uh, opening possible. Um, I think there are states who are thinking about that um, without more information, unfortunately, on immunity. Um, this idea of immunity passports or returning to work with immunity is still not uh, solidified, I don't think, quite yet, although I think that that would be sort of one option for reopening if we had more information about immunity. But um, for me, I, personally, I think the conversations on reopening are a little bit premature, and I say that with the knowledge that that has many economic and social consequences associated. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there other questions out that people like to pose via video or, or by hands while we're, uh, while we're waiting? I think, Nadia, a question that, that I had, um, I've been thinking about you this week, um, the, the states that are reopening, um, it does seem to provide epidemiological data 
in the coming weeks for what happens when you open the state, even if it's ill-advised or even if it seems that it's at the wrong time or place. And I wonder how uh, uh, folks like you in your community are, are thinking about that as an opportunity to hone, hone models um, and to uh, recalibrate models because we, models obviously just need to be constantly recalibrated both in assumptions and in the, the metrics. And um, so how does that look when you're gathering new data like this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, this will provide new data to calibrate models with. I think it will provide us with an opportunity to do a little bit more sensitivity analyses with regards to the data that we've had before. Um, I think it will also challenge the structure of some of our models. Some of the assumptions that we've had about asymptomatic transmission will certainly uh, be challenged with the reopening of some states. I think more information on um, risk for younger people will also become uh, challenged by the reopening of states. Um, and then also hospital capacity will also be challenged. So these are all elements of models that I think uh, will, be have, will have to be revised um, with new data that might come out of these openings. Um, we, the cool thing about modeling is you can sort of treat these reopenings as an intervention in the model, as a natural experiment. So um, they could allow us to explore what would happen in a state should they open. Um, and I think that, you know, speaking from a data and a modeling standpoint, that's va valuable information. But I think, again, there are general risks to human health that need to be considered with this reopening. So, um, you know, it's not all, <laughs> not all positive and we have to weigh the positives and the negatives. Yeah, I mean, that's been, that's been what's on my mind as well is that, uh, however, uh, ill-advised some of it might be it, it will provide data and perhaps it won't be as ill-advised as we hope or perhaps it will be worse hopefully not of course um, Josh uh, Rappaport had a question about the trends for positive rates for testing in Massachusetts um, uh, could you all speak about that about how how we're doing uh, both in expansive testing and the positive rates and the, also the I heard that there was some um, uh, concern about in Massachusetts about uh, um, immunological tests and their accuracy, so they're not being deployed widely yet. Uh, could you all speak to those questions? Sure, so the positive, uh, the positive rate for testing has gone down, um, which is actually a, a good thing in our eyes. Uh, essentially, it means that um, we're seeing probably that we're testing a, a, maybe not enough people, but we're testing the right people. Um, and so I think the last statistics I saw was it was somewhere around the 10% range, um, which seems promising. Um, you're right that there are a number of uh, zero, uh, te zero tests, so antibody tests that are out there. Unfortunately, because we don't um, know the sensitivity and specificity, how well those tests pick up on positive cases or negative cases, we actually don't know how uh, reliable they are. And so um, I think the challenge now is to assess how reliable they are in more uh, targeted ways um, before uh, going out with widespread zero surveys. So I think there's still going to be a bit of back and forth on the immunoassays, but I do know that many states and many cities have started their own serology um, programs and zero surveys to try to assess uh, prevalence despite uncertainty in um, the accuracy and the reliability of the antibody test. Right, and, and, and we hear, of course, that big laboratory outfits like the Broad Institute are scaling up. Uh, the reliability issue is obviously of critical importance, but it, it sounds like the scale up is moving forward and hopefully the reliability will shake out. Great, um, thanks. John has a question about the points of weakness in uh, national and international public health systems that have been most clearly exposed by this. Um, and I think the thrust of the question seems to be what changes, how do we look forward? How do we move forward now that we've seen these, um, these weaknesses revealed? I guess one question might be, are they weaknesses we weren't aware of before? Um, and secondly, are they weaknesses that can be fixed while the, you know, while the, while the car's on fire, as it were, or are they things that need to come for the next pandemic? I, I would answer that by saying two big things. There's lots of secondary and tertiary things, but, but two big ones. Number one is the failure to be prepared. The fact that we, in this country and in another, a number of other countries, have allowed public health systems to disintegrate, uh, 
county health departments across the United States in the aggregate have lost something like 40% of their budget and staff over the past 15 or 20 years. The boots on the ground that we used to have at the local level are simply not there today. And even at the state and national level, pandemic preparedness has mostly been ignored. It's always been left for another day. The stockpiles of emergency equipment and medications haven't been maintained. The leadership isn't there. So uh, the failure to prepare and then the, the, the ignoring, sometimes the deliberate ignoring of early warnings. I mean, there, was a, there were reports just the, in the Washington Post uh, last night or early this morning that it was known at the White House as early as the first couple of weeks in January that this epidemic was brewing up in China um, and it was ignored, it was dismissed, it was denigrated and precious time was lost. But the two are related. If we had had a robust response capacity already in place, the people who are in charge of that capacity would have picked up on those early warnings and they would have done the right thing, one hopes. The other thing I think is, um, from my perspective, data collection. So um, I think one clear um, issue with our data collection efforts in the past is they weren't necessarily picking up on important patterns related to race in particular, but of course socioeconomic status. Um, and so what I've seen now is huge efforts to um, update our data collection to include uh, sociodemographic factors that may be influencing um, risk. So that is another piece that I think hopefully we'll see an improvement on um, moving forward as well. Looking forward to the summer, um, there are two things, two other things on my mind. Um, one is when are we going to finally be able to order a mask or uh, gloves and Purell and all these things that are that are for the regular people? Not, you know, I understand there's medic still continuing issues for medical supplies, but um, as a as a regular person, as a citizen. Um, it's surprising to me that now we're two months into this and still shortages of all these things exist. Um, I wonder if you have any uh, speculations about that. And the other summer related um, question I had is why are national parks shut down and uh, hiking trails and things like that when we're all getting cooped up? I wonder from a medical and epidemiological standpoint if there's good reasons for that uh, beyond the obvious uh, concentration of people at a trailhead. Um, but uh, we all need a little break. So give us some hope. I, I think it'd be great to open up parks, but people have to maintain distance. Um, and um, I have no idea why the basic supplies are still lagging. You would think that the companies that make them see an opportunity here to make a nice profit by ramping up production. So maybe that's happening, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. The supply chain I'm particularly worried about is the food supply chain right now. So there's been discussion mm -hmm. about um, a lack of uh, sort of being able to sustain our meat production, being able to sustain our fruit and vegetable production going into the summer. Um, for me, that is what keeps me up a little bit at night in terms of being able to have a stable uh, food supply chain. I think um, parks is a really tricky issue, especially with the number of people that are going to parks, uh, going to trails, um, how is it that we can make them accessible while keeping people safe? I think there are definitely creative ways, um, but they all require significant resources and monitoring, which may not be possible right now when a lot of states and cities resources are being uh, targeted towards the coronavirus. Okay, it's fair to say that uh, uh, parks are not the most important <laughs> thing we need to be worried about, um, uh, for sure. I mean, the global food supply, it seems uh, that's a labor issue as much as anything, right? Uh, about uh, getting people together in plants and packaging and fields and things, right? Um, and, tra and transport. And transportation, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, um, that's a, another uh, ripple to this that will be hard to, hard to manage in the longer term. Let's take one last question uh, from Rosemary. She's asking about um, uh, developing nations and the impact as it rolls out. It seems to be something of a delay. We haven't yet seen the worst of things in, in India and in the subcontinent or in many African nations uh, that are just starting to develop this. Um, and the question is, uh, what is our responsibility as a wealthy nation in this uh, global uh, condition? How can we help other nations at risk? I know this is something you both think quite a lot about. Well, I, I can, let me 
offer a quick thought or two, and I know Nadia will have um, insight. So I think most of the low income countries in the world are going to suffer, suffer very badly from this because they, they simply don't have the poorest of the poor countries simply don't have the medical resources to do any kind of effective supportive care except except home care for sick people and people are going to be lost we may never know the full toll because reporting systems in those same countries are are weak um, the only thing that may save sub-saharan africa is the fact that the mean age of the population is only about 20 years and so and there aren't really that many other in, in terms of absolute numbers, there are lots of old people, but on a proportionate basis, the fraction of the population that's above 50 or above 60, and certainly above 80 is very small, much much different than it is here in the US or Europe. But, but nonetheless, the, the, the death toll is gonna to be great. On the other hand, not all countries are equal. And I was exchanging emails just yesterday with um, a remarkable woman, her name is Agnes Benyawajo, She's a pediatrician and uh, was formerly the Minister of Health for Rwanda, now the Vice Chancellor of one of the medical schools in Rwanda. And Rwanda is a very, a very tight society. They went through that horrible genocide back in the 1990s. They've done a very deliberate, intentional reconciliation. They've tried to recreate the country and build a sense of community. For, for my taste it's a little bit too top down the president recently declared himself president for life which is never a good omen but he's been a good leader paul kagami and they immediately put uh, a whole series of um, provisions in place exactly what we would have liked to have seen in this country they stopped incoming passenger flights to the country from overseas the only planes that land there now are cargo flights carrying food Anybody who came in was immediately put into isolation for 14 days. People have been staying in their homes, in their villages, they've been wearing masks. And they've had something like 183 cases in a country of 8 million people. So poor countries with leadership can do it. But I think that's the exception. I think most of them are gonna suffer badly. That's really helpful, thanks. Nadia. And on the responsibility side, I mean, I think what we're seeing now is especially with the defunding, the United States defunding of the World Health Organization, is this sort of um, feeling that perhaps we should be focusing our resources on ourselves and not on other countries, which I think um, is not the precedent that has previously been set by the United States, especially if you think of things like HIV and AIDS with the President's Emergency uh, you know, AIDS Relief Fund and, and other funds that have been in place in the past. Um, I do think that there is a precedent for high-income countries to aid um, low-income or developing countries. Um, and so it will be really interesting to see how this pans out given the economic crises that's, that are happening in many of the high -income. And of course, as an international studies, you know, faculty member, we have to note that these are, um, that, that one thing that the pandemic has hammered home with 100% clarity is that we are all connected and that uh, helping to care for uh, people in other parts of the world is is um, is the right thing to do, but it is very clearly also the thing to do in order to care for people within our own country. Um, and with the resources we have, there, it's not uh, simply an either or some, even if we are in serious financial strains in this country, um, that's an investment for everybody. Um, yeah. Well, uh, we've reached the end of our time. Would either of you like uh, any parting words before we close out for the day? Well, just thank you to everybody. This this has really been great. It's, I, th I think it's, you know, I hope we've been good for you, but it's certainly been been good for us. I've, I've learned from that or I've learned from the interactions. It's so important to hear from the community what the, what are the concerns and the questions. So thank you. Yeah, and thanks for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, I hope that everyone continues to take care of themselves. Um, and I will say, and I'm sure Phil will agree, if there are questions or if there's ways that we can support you offline, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm more than happy to try to continue the conversation in other ways as well. Yeah. Yes, thank you both. Uh, We're on the BC system. We are sending our love and care to all the people watching and, um, and we'll be here together working on this. We'll try to keep in touch along the way. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks Nadia and Phil for all of your time and energy you've put into this. Uh, we will see you all, whatever the fall looks like, uh, we'll see you all again then. Thank you and uh, take care of each other. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.